It is an honor to support a courageous woman such as Anne Marie Waters. I want to talk to you about civilizational war. Muhammad was the greatest warrior who ever lived. Today, no one dies because of Caesar, Napoleon, or Alexander the Great, but someone died today because of Muhammad. He was able to take and make all aspects of life a weapon of war. And since Islam is a complete way of life, an entire civilization, there are a lot of weapons. Let me show you two differences between us and Islamic society. Our civilization is based on the ethical cornerstone of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, called the Golden Rule. I call it the Unitary Ethic. Islam has a dualistic ethical system. How you're treated depends on who you are. There are seven verses in the Quran which state that a Muslim is not the friend of a Kafir. Another way that we differ is this. Our intellectual system is based on critical thought, fact-based reasoning. Islamic civilization is based on authoritative reasoning. Nothing is allowed to violate what is found in the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. Here's how clothing can be made a weapon of war. In Macedonia, for instance, if you convert to Islam and you'll wear a hijab, you'll get a monthly salary. And in America, we find that some demands are made that hijabs be worn even if you're a salesperson and no one else wears one. So the hijab can be made a weapon of war, civilizational war. If you buy a hot dog on the streets of New York, you'll buy a halal hot dog. Why? Because all hot dogs are halal. Now, how did this come about? Well, I'm not sure, but I do know that it's true. Marshmallows can be a weapon of war. My daughter has a child in school who came home with a note, and the note said, do not bring gummy bears, a chewy candy, or marshmallows to school. And my daughter said, why is this? So she asked within the school system and discovered that Muslims had come in and said, gummy bears and marshmallows have pork in them in gelatin form, and we don't want our children to eat them, so we don't want them in the schools at all. So marshmallows became a weapon of civilizational war. They're shut out of the schools. Now, we like to say that Jewish law says that Jews don't eat pork, but Sharia law says no one eats pork. We see this in our prisons. Once you have enough Muslim prisoners, they demand halal food. Then, after halal food is given to the Muslim prisoners, the next demand is the whole prison eats halal food. We find this in schools. If there's a lot of Muslim students in the schools, and they don't want to eat our food but want to eat halal food, then once it's fixed in a few schools, the demand is made for the entire school system to serve halal food. Then we have finances. Sharia finance includes the zakat, and the zakat is a tax, and that tax money can be used for jihad. If we're talking about jihad, let's talk about the different kinds of jihad. And by the way, jihad is not war. Jihad just means struggle or effort. Now, when you think of jihad, you probably think of jihad of the sword, because it's the violent jihad. But that, oddly enough, is the least dangerous form of jihad. More dangerous than jihad of the sword is jihad of speech and pen. For instance, the Muslim Brotherhood took and created a word called Islamophobe, which implies you're crazy if you don't like Islam. Now, when I heard this, I thought, well, that'll never go anywhere, but it's gone all over the world. And now then, it shuts us up. Well, it doesn't shut me up, but it shuts many people up. I mean, they call you a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. And being threatened with being told that, a lot of people just say, well, I won't talk about Islam at all because I don't want to be a bigot or seen as a bigot. Now let's talk about the jihad of money. I sat in a mosque of Southern California and watched out of a group of about 50 people, maybe no more than 40, they raised $18,000 for the purpose of lawfare. Now lawfare is using an attorney to sue me over some issue and then at the very end, dropping the whole case after I've spent my own time and money. They were clear what it was to be used for. Now, the Quran is filled with exhortations to do this. In the United States now, as well as in other places around the world, Muslims are running for office. In Nashville, Tennessee, we have elected our first councilwoman who's a Muslim. Now, who voted for her? Well, of course, all the Muslims did. And by the way, they vote nearly 99% of them. But the other people who voted for her were the people who wanted to be tolerant, because tolerance is such a virtue, and here was a chance to exercise your tolerance by voting for a Muslim. Then there's jihad of complaints. If you bring Muslims into your workplace, you will soon find they have something to complain about and something they want changed. 
Now let's talk about love jihad. This term was introduced to me by my Hindu friends. Love jihad is a Muslim male marrying a woman who's Hindu, Jewish, or Christian. Now what difference does this make? Well, if she's a Christian, as an example, the Christian womb is now producing Muslim children because it is the rule of Sharia that the children are all raised as Muslims. So this is love jihad. Then, of course, there's the hijra, immigration. Immigration is flooding the United States and Europe, and this is a form of jihad because it is a replacement method. Our citizens are being replaced with those who want Sharia law. Now let's look further at our enemies because we have two of them. We have Islam as the far enemy, their civilization, and then we have the near enemy or the apologist. Now let me state here I've never been harmed by a Muslim or Islam, but I have been harmed by apologist. Notice that I don't say left or right, but apologist. You can be an apologist for Islam and be a conservative Christian. You can be an apologist for Islam and be a leftist. That's all that matters to me is that you support Islam. What you do left or right is no consequence. Now, apologists do Islam's bidding and actual work, but in the end, Islam will destroy both the left and the right. Let me give you an example. The Tudor party was the communist party in Iran and they overthrew the Shah and brought in Khomeini, a Muslim. Now you would think that they would be seen as best allies because they brought him to power. Five days after he went to power, he had death warrants issued for all the Tudor party members. Now then, here's some of the ways that apologists harm us, and these aren't Muslims. Their stated policy is to drive haters out of business, and we see this in my life. They demonetize my YouTube channel, Last week, PayPal threw me off their books. Why did they do this? I don't know. They said it was terms and conditions, but who knows what that means. But they know that I stand against Islam and that's all they need. We find that textbooks have been published by apologists that tell us that Islam is the highest civilization that's ever existed. In the seventh grade of here in Tennessee, you will learn that Islam gives women their rights and that they were the first to give women their rights. That they protect Christians and Jews that the high point of human civilization has been the golden age in Baghdad and Spain. Now none of these things are true, so they harm our civilization, but they're not said by Muslims. These are said by Kafirs, non-Muslims. Mainstream media. Well, the mainstream media doesn't report much about immigration or jihad. I've just gotten to where I presume if there's some dastardly deed that's done, for instance, in the streets of London, if there's no mention of the name or there's no picture, whether it's true or not, I just presume it's a jihadi because they support the jihadis by covering up their work as much as possible. Do I need to present the case that social media is pro-Islam and an apologist? How many people have been thrown off of Facebook by telling the truth about Islam? I've been shadow banned on Twitter, thrown off of Facebook in Germany. And it used to be if you search for political Islam, which is a term, by the way, that I created, if you did it on Google, the first three full screens were all about my work. Well, that's gone now, two-thirds of it. Why? Don't know. It just disappeared. Now, here's something else we need to talk about. Muhammad not, not only invented civilizational war, he invented something called eternal war. Previous warriors have exerted themselves through long war, but Muhammad created a war that never ends as long as there's any kafir left on the face of the earth. Losing doesn't matter under this concept because it's generational. Let me give you an example. Islam invaded Spain in the year 711 and seven centuries later, 1492, they were driven out. You would think that would be a permanent loss. That loss is being compensated for today by Muslims immigrating into Spain. They plan on taking over Spain in this time. They want to keep it. In the Balkans where Islam was driven out, they're back today. And if you drive along the roads in Macedonia, it seems about every 20 miles there's a new Ottoman mosque, that is a Turkish mosque. You see, the advantage here is that Muslims keep time with a calendar and we keep time with a watch. They're willing to wait forever. Here's an example of waiting forever. The Bulgarians made a movie about the conquest of Bulgaria by the Ottoman Muslims. In it, a Christian is converted to Islam under force and he says to his Muslim friend, he says, I don't believe this stuff at all. And the Muslim replied, that doesn't make any difference because you will raise your children as Muslim, then they will raise their children as Muslims, 
And in the third generation, they'll be raised as Muslims, and they won't even know you ever existed. So who you are, what you do, doesn't matter. Here's another example. The Sufi, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the mastermind of 9-11, September 11th, World Trade Tower attack, said this, We will win because Americans don't realize. We do not need to defeat you militarily. We only need to fight you long enough for you to defeat yourself by quitting. Let's take, learn a lesson from this. Don't quit the fight. Eternal war gives you a great morale so you can be very creative in your thinking. Here's the way this is done. After September 11, 2001, the attack on the World Trade Towers, church phones began to ring and a voice on the other end of the line said, Hi, I'm such and such, a Muslim, and we would like to come to your church and present a talk on Islam, the religion of peace. My point is this. What other group could take a PR disaster like the World Trade Tower attacks and turn it around in three days' time in a national program to be an asset? Because what they said was, we're the real victims of 9-11. So they have good morale because they're going to win. It doesn't matter whether they win now or not. They'll win later. Now, if you have poor morale, you have dreadful creativity. Your creativity is destroyed by depression. We're way quick to say, Sweden is lost. France is lost. This drives me nuts. I hear this and I want to scream because this is the talk of losers. This is the talk of bad morale. And if you have bad morale, you can't win. If you have good morale and a will to win, you'll create a new way of fighting in which you do win. So morale is incredibly important. As a matter of fact, I like to say that if you don't have good morale, there's no sense in the warrior putting on his Kevlar. Now let's look at our situation today. We have some assets here. For the first time in human history, it is possible for the average person to understand the doctrine of Islam. It used to be that this knowledge was only held by experts, Arab language specialists, Middle East historians, theologians, but today a bus driver and a plumber can understand the doctrine of Islam. This means that we can use this as a weapon in an ideological war. Here's the deal. Kafirs know facts, apologists know opinions. Apologists know experts, and we know Allah and Muhammad. Now this is very important, because if I'm discussing Islam with someone, be they Kafir or Muslim, and they say something that I know is wrong, I can say Muhammad says or Allah says. No matter what expert you are, even if you're head of the Department of Islamic Studies at Al-Azhar University, if you contradict what Allah says or Muhammad did, you're wrong. So we now have a weapon whereby we can engage people in argument and debate and win every time if we know Allah and Muhammad. I like to say that I'm a student of Dr. Allah and Professor Muhammad, and I win my arguments. So this means that you can too. Now here's an example of fighting and not knowing your ideology. We have been in Afghanistan for 18 years, and we're no closer to winning now than we were when we started. As a matter of fact, we're further away from winning than when we started. I read a strategic paper written by the top general in Afghanistan. Three words did not occur in this paper. Islam, Muslims, and Jihad. Now here's a man saying he can beat the, whoever his enemy is because he doesn't name the enemy. He's going to beat them. He's not going to beat them. You're not going to beat anybody if you don't know your enemy and how they think. Now you would think that the CIA, which is an intelligence organization, or the FBI, would know a lot about Islam. I have friends who, were, who have retired from the CIA and the FBI, and they tell me consistently they know nothing about Islam. As a matter of fact, one friend of mine, a retired agent, retired talking to a young FBI agent about the nature of Islam and its ideology, and the man actually said, I don't want to hear this. This knowledge would only get me in trouble back at the agency. Think you can ask a Christian clergyman and learn something about Islam? He knows nothing about the Islamic doctrine of Christians. He doesn't know how to refute the arguments, so he's a loser too. Christians and clergy ignore the destruction of Christians in Africa and the Middle East and don't seem to have a clue that it's demanded by the doctrine of Islam. Now, for the first time, we can fight an ideological war. In the past, it's always been a sword, and this has not worked. Apologists censor us. Why? Because they're our real enemy because they cannot win an argument. So they say, take him off the stage. Now, what's tragic about this is, is we're losing the very legacy of our critical thought and debate. 
our civilization is based on rational thought and we are abandoning our heritage. This is a disaster. It's a form of suicide. We're losing the ability to have civil discourse. We deal with insults, not reasoning. And by the way, never stoop to name calling and insults. It's simply childish to do. You don't have to and you don't have to, so don't do it. Now Muslims are entering all aspects of our country. We're having elected officials, they sit on boards and councils. We must use every political meeting to Islamicize it. They want to take our stage away, let's go to their stage and declare an ideological war. We need to ask all candidates and create an issue of Islam, even if they're a Kafir and they're not running on anything that relates to Islam at all. But we need to Islamicize this. We need to take advantage of politics and grab the stage back which they're trying to remove us from on Facebook and other such places. It's easy to politicize a political gathering. Perhaps some brochures and hand them out to the audience. You'll see how it works. Here's a technique for asking questions. Pick the worst aspect of Islam. I'm going to choose child marriage and wife beating. And ask the person, will you reject and condemn wife beating and child marriage as is found in the Sharia and the Quran? Now if the Kafir says, well that's not found there, which they don't know, but they'll just deny it anyway to get out of the question, repeat it this way. If child marriage and wife beating were in the Quran and the Sharia, would you condemn it if it were there? See what they do with that. Now if they're a Muslim, they simply can't condemn what's in the Quran. That would be blasphemy. So they will say, oh, that's not in there. So ask the Muslim the same question. Well, if child marriage and wife beating were in the Quran, would you condemn it? Put them on the spot. Make them answer the question yes or no. We need to run candidates who oppose Sharia. Lots of candidates in all levels of office. Whether you get elected doesn't matter that much. I had a man visit me yesterday who plans to run for office in his county, a rural county, and he's doing so not for the purpose of winning, but for the purpose of discussing Islam. They cannot take that platform away from him. Let's get some things straight. We're involved in a civilizational war, and we have a better civilization. Our civilization is capable of correcting itself. We have to win, because our civilization is precious. So we need to fight against the apologist, not the Muslims. It is much easier to deal with an apologist who's usually a clergyman or a professor or somebody else instead of Muslims because we're less fearful. It's easy to talk to them. So we have to declare war against the apologists, not by being mean to them, but educating them. It's an ideological war. Remember this, courage is not the lack of fear. Courage is the act of doing something in the face of fear and it is time for us to become courageous. This is not some drill. This is not some exercise. This is fighting for the very existence of our civilization. It is a precious, beautiful, and wonderful civilization that is capable of correcting its errors, and we need to preserve it, and we need your efforts and the efforts of every other Kafir. Get out there and fight. Thank you.